The ongoing conflict in Ukraine has caused many countries to impose sanctions, but now other questions are starting to arise. And one of them is obviously how will various countries welcome Ukrainian refugees into their countries? And joining me now to discuss Canada's approach to doing that is Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Minister Sean Fraser. Minister, thanks so much for taking the time amidst what I'm sure is a very busy time for you. Um, perhaps we'll just start out with Obviously, as I mentioned in the introduction, Canada bringing in uh, Ukrainian refugees to Canada. How will Canada go about doing that? And furthermore, how will Canada ensure that when these Ukrainian refugees come to Canada, that they can be set out on a path to be able to succeed? Uh, well, first of all, thanks for having me back on the, uh, the program. It's great to see you again. And I really appreciate the opportunity to engage on an issue that's really, really important. Um, so before I get into the specifics of the new program that we launched, I think it's important to remember that we made a decision back uh, in mid-January before this latest invasion by Russian forces into Ukraine began uh, to start getting ready for the potential that there could be a significant uh, exodus of, of people from Ukraine that would be looking to uh, find safe haven in, in another country. Uh, we made a decision uh, as of January 19th to launch an internal task force to our department at uh, Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada. Some of the things that we did beginning that day included waiving all of the fees associated with applications from uh, Ukrainian nationals. For people who were already in Canada, we gave them permission to extend their stay longer and to apply for a work permit so they could continue to support themselves. We also took every application that was in the system already and started processing those on an expedited basis by essentially taking them out and dealing with those ones first because we knew a significant number of those people were going to require uh, an opportunity to, to come to Canada uh, more quickly than, than others may given the uh, security situation. There's a number of other things that we did at the time to get ready, including moving people and resources in the form of biometric kits that is part of the, um, the screening process for uh, the, the immigration effort to get them into the region to make sure we pre were prepared for the people who were moving. Uh, then, of course, uh, we created a brand new program. It's called the uh, Canada-Ukraine Authorization for Emergency Travel. And what we essentially did was we looked at what program had the most horsepower of any government program. And that's really the way that we welcome visitors, uh, because we can deal with, in ordinary circumstances, uh, more than 2 million applications a year, because it's the same way that we bring um, uh, tourists to Canada or temporary foreign workers or uh, international students even. And when people are coming on a, a temporary basis, we have the ability to process large numbers of people very fast. And we made a decision to pull off almost all of the requirements that would normally result in someone's inadmissibility to allow them to have a simplified and expedited process. Uh, this has been in place for a little bit more than two weeks, and we said it would have a two-week processing time. So we've now got the first few days of people who are getting approved, and we've got uh, now uh, in excess of 20,000 people have been approved to come to Canada through this new program. The second part of your question was what are we gonna do, not just to get people here, but to make sure that they're set up for success. And while we're still having conversations on some of these measures, there's a few really important things that we've done so far. So first we invested in uh, what we refer to as settlement supports. So there's these agencies right across Canada that are uh, perfectly in place to help people with things like language training, employment assistance, and a lot of the soft skills to let them adjust to life in their new community. We've also reached an agreement with the uh, Canadian Red Cross to set up uh, welcoming uh, uh, packages, so to speak, where they're actually meeting people at airports as of this week. And they're also making available uh, emergency uh, mental health services or, or crisis care for people who may need it when they arrive. They're also doing things like teaching people how to apply for social insurance numbers. It's a really challenging time uh, because we've seen now more than 4 million people flee westward from Ukraine in just a matter of weeks. And we're responding in real time to changes both on the ground in Europe, but also as people are starting to arrive in Canada. Uh, and I should say that uh, although we're just starting to see approvals through this new special program over the last number of days, uh, if we go back to the beginning of the year, we've now seen more than 12,000 Ukrainians arrive in Canada. And I expect we're going to see thousands and thousands more in the weeks and months ahead. And how can you continue to tackle some of the, you know, barriers that people are um, facing when trying to come to Canada as, you know, refugees? And specifically, furthermore, how can you speed up the, pro the application process of bringing Ukrainian refugees to Canada? 
So one of the things that uh, we're doing right now is, is implementing what we viewed to be the fastest possible way to get people uh, to Canada. So when you ask um, uh, how can we speed up the process, uh, one of this was a conversation that we were having a number of weeks ago when we wanted to design this new Canada-Ukraine authorization for emergency travel. Um, the reason that we went with the, uh, the pathway that we chose was it was the quickest to set up a new system. So we were, as I said, pulling any files in our system attached to uh, Ukrainian applicants uh, out of the system and processing them on a priority basis. But then we made this decision to set up this new specific stream. And what we did is we took off a lot of the requirements that are usually uh, usually assessed when a person is uh, trying to uh, come to Canada from uh, different countries in the world. Um, by removing a lot of these barriers and by making sure that we're having people in place and the equipment in place to process them, and even in some instances, borrowing staff from other government departments to make sure our processing capacity was there, we've now seen in the last couple of weeks, um, more than 20,000 people who've been approved, uh, who just started applying a couple of weeks ago. Um, we're going to continue to put resources in place, uh, including $117 million to deal with some of the costs of getting people here, setting them up. But one of the other things that we need to do is we can't assume we got it right and just leave it there. We need to continue to watch what's happening on the ground. We're right now in the process of setting up additional locations in the cities of Warsaw and Berlin, because we're seeing enormous traffic through those locations. To the extent that we can uh, monitor the situation and continue to move people and resources where the applications are going to be coming in, we're going to serve ourselves very well. Uh, in the last week or so, we've already moved uh, not just resources into Warsaw and Berlin, but also Vienna, Bucharest, Bratislava, and other locations in the region to make sure that we continue to uh, be fluid in our response so we can process as many people as quickly as possible to get them here. And I guess specifically, my next question would just be, when looking at, you know, the process at which Canada is, you know, using to bring Ukrainian refugees to Canada as quickly as possible, um, how does that compare to maybe the process that other countries, you know, are using and what factors were kind of um, put into the decision as to how we would bring Ukrainian refugees to Canada? So we invented a new system from scratch in Canada, uh, and the primary motivation was, was speed. Uh, we wanted to get people here as quickly as possible, and I just uh, outlined the, the nature of our response. There are some other countries that have taken different approaches. But one of the unique features about uh, life in Europe for, for a lot of people is that uh, travel within Europe uh, is, uh, ha has far fewer barriers than travel through uh, other portions of the world. So people who um, live in Ukraine are entitled to uh, uh, travel throughout much of Europe. And European countries have said that they will uh, deal with people who, who show up in their countries and um, have some supports in place. Uh, the United Kingdom has had a bit of a different approach that also has uh, this sort of temporary um, uh, temporary uh, model that they'll allow people to come in for, for a period of time. Uh, the United States, which is usually our closest comparator, has announced that they'll take uh, 100,000 people, but they haven't necessarily fleshed out exactly the, the level of detail that we have in Canada. Uh, it's a work in progress uh, for a lot of them. But in Canada, one of the reasons that um, uh, we want it to respond quickly and, and with a little more substance uh, in terms of how we're going to um, uh, get people here in the mechanics of the process uh, is not only that uh, this is a really, really important conflict, uh, but there's an enormous number of Ukrainians in Canada. Uh, we've heard uh, early on that people uh, from from Ukraine or or that have been in Canada for generations that now live here, um, we've heard that uh, they wanted us to have an ambitious response, but they were also giving us information about what they were hearing from people on the ground. What we were hearing was that a lot of people who were going to come are wanting to go back home when it's safe to do so. So they advise us uh, in some instances against a formal refugee resettlement program where you know you're taking people who will plan to be in your country for the rest of their lives. Um, they, we also heard that though that we may need to put supports in place for some of these people, for those who do have the ability to work, that they want it to make sure that they can support themselves. Uh, so we've attached an open work permit to the process, which means essentially any Canadian business 
can hire the Ukrainians who are coming here that do have the capacity to work, which will not be true for everyone, given that they're just fleeing a, a war zone. And many of them will be elderly or many of them will be children. So trying to respond to those kinds of details and the feedback of the Ukrainian Canadian community, uh, as well as people that are on the ground with the presence has been an important facet. But I hope that gives you idea of some of the unique features of the Canadian response compared to the other countries that you were asking about. And one final question, Minister, before you go, I mean, in terms of how long these programs will go on for, obviously, you know, the conflict between Russia and Ukraine and obviously the, you know, tragic things that are happening as it relates to that will probably be going on for at least a decent while longer. Um, So I guess for people who are currently in Ukraine, um, who really haven't made up their mind yet as to whether they want to leave Ukraine, whether they want to you know, stay in Ukraine because a, a large portion of them are still want, deciding to stay in uh, Ukraine. How long will those programs go on for? And, you know, will, you know, let's say people have decided to maybe stay in Ukraine, but then change their mind, will there still be an opportunity for them to come to Canada? Yeah. So look, just before I give you specific program details, um, let me just say that one of the reasons we wanted to offer such a substantial response and process as many applications uh, as you Ukrainians make to our program is the fact that they're defending really important values. Um, they're defending the, the values of sovereignty of nations, of the territorial integrity of states, and the right to peoples of self-determination to choose who represents them, to choose uh, who gets to make decisions that impact the quality of their lives. Uh, those are values that are really important to me as a Canadian and as somebody who's got a background in international law. Um, if they're willing to lay down their lives to defend the freedoms that I hold most dear, uh, then I think we need to uh, offer a significant and substantial immigration response to make sure that the burden of this mass exodus people uh, doesn't just fall to our, our friends and allies in Eastern Europe or across the European continent. Um, this means that we have to continue to assess what our programs are going to look like on an ongoing basis. Um, We started uh, with a commitment to answer your question more precisely, to have this uh, special uh, authorization for emergency travel to last two years with an open work permit. What we were hearing, uh, just to your point exactly, is that a lot of people haven't made up their mind to travel and they're uh, applying for the Canadian program, not knowing if they're going to travel right away. And to build additional flexibility, we extend permission under that program to three years instead of two. To the extent that the conflict on the ground uh, requires us to continue to consider how we need to adjust our programs, it's really important that we don't sit in a boardroom in in Ottawa and assume that we know what life is like for someone who's just left Ukraine. We need to continue to engage with people, hear what's happening on the ground, hear how people are doing when they get here, and adjust our programs as necessary to make sure that we are doing our part to defend those values that our Ukrainian friends are are laying their lives down uh, for on the other side of the world. Okay, Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Minister Sean Fraser. Minister, thanks so much for speaking with me and for providing some of your insight as to obviously what's, as I mentioned earlier, a tragic situation currently happening in Ukraine. Wyatt, thank you so much for shining a light on this important, important issue. And it's such a pleasure to be with you again. I look forward to checking in next time. Thank you.